five-week election process in which two out of three from an electorate of 900 million peacefully voted for a change of government. And so as you look across Asia, you can see some great examples of democracy thriving and, and you know, strengthening for the future. Um, and as you all know, much of the discussion we've had over the last day and a half has been on the bad side of the ledger, China, uh, where there's really not much sense yet of moves toward democracy. In fact, we just commemorated the 30th, 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen crackdown, uh, one of the, the best attempts in, in recent years for, for China to move towards a democratic future. Um, our panelists this afternoon will begin to unpack some of these, um, these trends that they see in the region. Uh, they'll each speak for a few minutes, uh, and then we'll open up for discussion from the, and questions from the floor. Dan, we'll start with you. Okay, thanks, Michael. I'm so delighted to be here with you and Roy and Senator Gordon and the whole team. I, I'm so grateful for what NBR does uh, and have been for many years. So thank you for all that contribution to Asia policy and scholarship and research. Um, I'm going to go broad, and my colleagues are going to go deep. So I'm just going to set the scene here a little bit, and I would like to start, without going deep at all, with the fact that uh, 10 days ago you had a million Hong Kong citizens in the streets. Uh, Carrie Lam pulled that extradition bill from legislative consideration. You then had 2 million Hong Kong people in the streets, which is 25% of the entire population of Hong Kong. So. Obviously, you all have been talking about this, and we'll talk more about it. But when, whenever you hear an argument that says Chinese people or Chinese culture or Confucian values or whatever it is don't value individual liberty and freedoms, there is just so much evidence to refute that, including coming from China itself. Uh, so uh, it really is so striking to so many of us that after commemorating the very grim 30th anniversary of uh, Tiananmen Square that you had almost simultaneously, almost like in a split screen, these incredible images of very brave Hong Kong citizens stepping up from all walks of life uh, on an issue that they just care about so much. And it's a reminder, moving to point two, uh, that there is a reaction, not just outside of China, but frankly inside of China, to the Xi Jinping centralization project. I think a lot of us, certainly a lot of my uh, uh, colleagues in the wider universe have talked themselves into believing that there is a different Chinese way, that the Chinese Communist Party has perfected a model, a kind of a techno-authoritarian model that has delivered extraordinary economic performance for many years, lifting more people than in any other country out of poverty, building a middle-class society, uh, creating global tech leaders, et cetera, et cetera, things many of you know much more about than I do. Uh, but really, there are these evident countercurrents, which is that building a high tech innovation middle class society under really an uber Leninist model, not just of party control, but of the centralization of power in one man, that there is an innate tension there. Uh, and it's not clear that the CCP modernization project, frankly, will succeed along political lines. Uh, as long as uh, these trends continue to emanate from China. So what I hear, and many of you follow this much more closely, is that there are ever more rumblings in leadership circles in China about are we taking the right course, right? Not in terms of necessarily all of these external developments in Chinese foreign policy, but in terms of the centralization project in China itself, which has been so enabled by digital technology. So that's point two. I'd certainly love to come back to all these issues. Point three, I mean, as Michael mentioned, India and Indonesia, together you had more than a billion Asians voting just in the last couple of months. Um, actually, surprisingly successful elections. Modi's majority grew substantially in India, the BJP majority, Jokowi's re-election, et cetera. Um, uh, it's always surprising to me when people look at smaller Asian countries uh, or they look at China and they see a highly illiberal anti-democratic trend. Because I think a lot of us look at South and Southeast Asia, as well as the democracies, the rich democracies in East Asia, and we see a region where democracy looks rather vigorous and robust. Um, again, I'm happy to come back to these issues. I mean, I think there are some concerns in both India and Indonesia around majoritarian politics uh, and other forms of online mobilization that are not healthy. Uh, but really, uh, these are cases where citizens turned out 
rather dramatically to express their preferences in free votes and deliver decisive outcomes. Democracy is working in those countries. Point four, um, there are lots of countries where if we had been sitting here even a couple years ago, we would be talking about them in totally different ways. And one of those is Malaysia, right? Where for the first time in more than six decades, an opposition coalition won in a system that the then ruling party had so gerrymandered and shaped that it was very, very <laughs> difficult. I mean, I'm understating the degree of difficulty involved in uh, defeating uh, the former UMNO coalition. Uh, Malaysians did this uh, not because they all have Jeffersonian democracy dreams, but because they were fed up with corruption and elite capture and that nexus of business and politics under the one party state in Malaysia. Uh, and it was their choice. Uh, they did it despite extraordinary odds. Uh, their leaders are uh, undertaking uh, a set of reforms, some uh, more slowly than others, uh, try to grapple with really a systemic change in Malaysian politics after, again, more than six decades of one-party rule, which shows that the region can always surprise us, right? Um, point five is that, of course, the trends are not even everywhere. Uh, the trends are uneven. Uh, even in countries like Thailand, uh, that do not enjoy genuine democracy, the ruling system went to extraordinary lengths to ape democratic forms in these recent elections, extraordinary lengths. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, the Hun Sen regime uh, went to some lengths to ape a democratic election last July, which of course wasn't a democratic election. Uh, but it's quite interesting that really outside of North Korea, um, even in countries that are struggling, that I think we would not call functioning democracies, uh, democratic forms are still valued enough that strong men, strong leaders, authoritarians, uh, work to manipulate the system within uh, those forms. Point six, um, and I don't worry, I only have seven. Uh, <laughs> there are a set of <coughs> dangers to watch. I mean, the thing about democracy uh, the thing about democracy is it doesn't solve all your problems. Americans have realized that. We've been working on it for over 200 years. All of our problems are not solved. Democracy does not create heaven on earth. What it does is it prevents mob rule. It prevents civil war, right? That's kind of the basic what democracy does. And ideally, it should protect human liberty and freedom, right? That is the idea of a democratic system. It's not Democracy is not an end in itself. It's a means to things we value more in life, like human freedom and dignity and inalienable rights, okay? And human nature being what it is, there is always going to be a struggle. I work in a democracy NGO. We work in 90 countries. 35 years from now, we were founded 35 years ago, I suspect we'll still be working in 90 countries because the work is never really done, right? Um, and so we're gonna talk more about Bangladesh with the ambassador, where I do think there is a set of concerns around the lack of political, the difficulty of political participation uh, by the opposition, which is definitely worth talking about because I think it will inculcate and breed more dangerous forms of alienation and extremism. Uh, there is a problem in Cambodia that involves Chinese state capture. Uh, Cambodia had an election last July in which the ruling party won 125 seats out of 125 seats. And the ruling party didn't do that because it's 100% popular. It did that because there was literally no democratic choice, right? There, were, there, was, there was no credible opposition able to run in that election. Uh, and we have seen malign forms of foreign influence grow there. Uh, a country like Vietnam, which has so much possibility and potential and has had such an extraordinary trajectory over the last 20 years, uh, there are always going to be limits to Vietnam's partnership with the United States as long as it is not a more open society, as long as it arrests peaceful bloggers and dissidents, right? That is going to put a ceiling on security cooperation, the kind of security cooperation that Vietnam's leaders actually crave with the United States. And then concerns around majoritarian politics. Uh, you know, I think you've seen that in Sri Lanka. Uh, we, some people worry that you will see more of it in India. Uh, we have seen some of it in Bangladesh, but this concern that uh, you get a, a strong majority that does not protect those minority rights that are so essential to any democracy, again, through the prism of individual liberty and freedom. Uh, finally, uh, point seven, the trend line in Asia. I kind of started with this, so I'll end with it. Um, 
Look, the big Asian tigers, I mean, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, many of you weren't born when they became Asian tigers, but those are the original Asian tigers. Now they're rich, wealthy democracies. Um, uh, that trend was argued, it was argued that that was something about Confucian society, East Asian cultural values. There were all these cultural exceptionalist arguments made for why this could only happen in a set of societies in East Asia. You have then seen that trend spread through Southeast Asia with the democratization of countries like Indonesia, of countries like Malaysia, the, the full democratization. You've seen it, obviously, the Asian tiger uh, uh, element take off in South Asia with Bangladesh's extraordinary development trajectory, now higher per capita income than either uh, India or Pakistan. It's really uh, an extraordinary economic story. You see India as the fastest growing big economy. I mean, I think we can have a debate about some of those numbers, but uh, India's economic takeoff following about 20 years behind uh, where <coughs> China has been. Uh, so you've seen this trend that is not culturally unique or exceptional. In fact, it's pan-Asian. Uh, you've had successive, sorry, I'll stop with Pakistan, just going doing the sweep, but you've had successive civilian transitions in Pakistan. Again, uh, an quite a problematic element in Pakistani politics, the role of the military. But uh, there, is nothing, uh, there is nothing exceptionalist, I would argue, about the human craving for greater freedom and opportunity. And the fact that as these countries become successful, strong middle class, and throw off that least developing country kind of G77 approach or that post-colonial approach, people actually want the same things. They want accountable politics. They want leaders who are not corrupt. They want opportunity under the law, right? Prospects for their children. Um, these are things that Americans understand because they're the same things we want. And I will just close with the thought that so many people see China, the PRC, the modern incarnation of Xi Jinping's China as really Asia's pace setter, as its leader. And through this prism, China actually looks a bit like an outlier. In fact, it looks dramatically like an outlier in Asia, not like the pace setter. And I will, I will stop there, but I'd love to pick back up what that means, because I think it means we have a lot more to work with when we think about a U.S. approach, a strategy to all of Asia and all the elements of power and influence that we can work with because of this democratic infrastructure that is there. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, let's stay on China. That's a perfect <laughs> transition to Carolyn. So over to you. Thank you very much, though. First, uh, Michael, I'll note that the, the, what you said about the voter participation rates in other countries should really put us to shame here in the United States, where so many people do not exercise that basic right. right. Um, I do want to thank NBR for the opportunity to participate. I associate myself with the comments that, that Dan made about the quality and the important work that you all do. So it's really a thrill for me to be here. Um, the views I'm expressing are my own. We always need to say that when, we, when we're talking about something as, as associated with topics that the commission works on. When Roy asked me to speak on democracy in Asia at today's event, it was May 23rd, and we had just left a series of discouraging meetings in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong legislature, the LegCo, looked to be on the verge of passing an extradition bill that by allowing extradition to the mainland would essentially blow a giant hole in the concept of one country, two systems. I thought when I accepted, I would be giving a fairly standard explanation of why Hong Kong matters and why we should be concerned about Beijing's increasing encroachment there. Of course, Hong Kong matters because having a place with an independent judiciary and the rule of law abutting mainland China is a powerful symbol of the importance of democratic values. It matters because there are 85,000 US citizens and over 1,300 US businesses in Hong Kong. It matters because Hong Kong is an international global financial system serving as a gateway to investment and commerce going into China and coming out of it. It also matters because we're living in a time of increasing threat to, to liberal democracy around the world and preserving and protecting the rights of millions of people to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and freedom of association is important to all of us who cherish and respect those freedoms. All of those statements are important reminders of why Hong Kong matters. But the extraordinary events of the past 10 days, which I do not think we could have predicted coming out of the meetings we were in, the millions of people, young, old, rich, poor, professional, working class, students and mothers, artists and teachers, lawyers and housewives, who engaged in civil, civic action have demonstrated courage and determination, which serves as an example of democratic principles in action to people around the world. Their actions, their commitment to speak out to preserve their way of life 
is a stronger example of democracy in Asia than any statement I would actually be able to make. So many examples of Hong Kong's vibrant citizenry and commitment to basic freedoms have been illustrated in the past weeks. Concern has been growing among those of us who follow Hong Kong over the past 20 years about a decline in freedom of the press, accompanied by a growing concern about self-censorship, which was part of that decline. But Hong Kong journalists' commitment to covering all aspects of the recent events, including putting themselves on the front lines, demonstrated their dedication to freedom of the press and their professional responsibility to hold government accountable. In response, in the first protests, they were targeted by the Hong Kong police. Among the 27 complaints filed by the Hong Kong Journalists Association, there were 10 cases where police fired tear gas at journalists at close range. Three journalists were hit in the head with it, one was hit with beanbag or rubber bullets, and many were prevented from reporting. But working from the midst of these million person crowds, multiple <coughs> reporters noted protesters protecting them. Alexandra Stevenson of the New York Times noted the kindness extended to her and to other reporters, including offers of food, water, and goggles. People were pulling reporters away when tear gas was being fired, and the crowds parted to let journalists get through so they could cover the stories. To protest police violence and harassment of journalists, a number of Hong Kong journalists showed up to the first press conference by the chief of police dressed up in protective gear for reporting on the front lines of unrest. They wanted to make the point that they had been at risk for doing their jobs. The thuggishness, thuggishness of Hong Kong police in their initial response to the protesters displayed alarming similarity to the thuggish behavior of domestic security forces in the mainland. It was unnerving to see the pictures of crowds of hundreds of thousands of young people juxtaposed with 5,000 riot police so close to the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. It was reported that some of the Hong Kong police have actually received training in Xinjiang, Xinjiang, where the Chinese government has imprisoned over a million Uyghurs in camps and where it has instituted a surveillance state that is Orwellian in its reach. It was also reported that a backdoor in the hospital authority's patient information system allowed Hong Kong police to use an interface to access confidential patient information, which resulted in the arrests of patients in the hospital for injuries caused by police excessive use of force. They tracked down people who had injuries that looked like they were coming from participating in the protest. People, uh, uh, people organizing the protests online are up against a very powerful foe. Hong Kong authorities are using some of the same tactics that Beijing uses to police the internet. The New York Times reported that the day before the protests flared in Hong Kong, 10 police officers showed up at the house of a young man administering a chat group. They forced him to open his phone and took data on a 20,000 person chat group organizing the protests. We have yet to see the consequences of the people for the people who participated in all of this. I would say we have to keep an eye on it. Six months down the road, a year down the road, we might be finding that people have been targeted. A lot of this organizers used the Telegram messaging, messenger service uh, to organize the protests. It was hit by a powerful DDoS attack, a distributed denial of service attack reportedly originating in the mainland. Meanwhile, inside China, Authorities scrubbed the internet to remove any references to Hong Kong and what was going on there. A Financial Times reporter in Beijing tweeted that he got a call from an editor in Hong Kong and China Mobile sent him a message saying he should exercise caution and be on guard against risks. But the Hong Kong protesters were so organized with medical stations, water, snacks, eye goggles and masks, they developed a protest sign language of hand signals to request things when people needed them and to get these things through the, the, the crowds. Many reporters obviously have noted that the crowds parted when an ambulance needed to get through and others have focused on how protesters went back to the sites of the protests to clean up the trash and to do recycling because they did not want to be called thugs. The creativity of the protesters using multiple modes of communication online and on paper to transmit information will serve as a model to others fighting authoritarian governments. And that, of course, is what Beijing is afraid of. 
CCP leaders cannot be happy that photos of throngs of protesters were on the front pages of major newspapers and magazines around the world repeatedly. The propaganda inside China was so blatantly false, it was almost laughable. A China Daily headline on June 10th, when there were a million people in the streets for the first protest was, 800,000 say yes to the rendition bill. And on June 16th, when two million people made it to the streets, it was parents in the Hong Kong special administrative region took to the streets on Sunday to urge US politicians to not interfere with the SAR's extradition amendments and its internal affairs. But with no independent sources of, in of information inside China, that's all many people saw or heard about world-shaking events in Hong Kong. With LegCo elections coming up next year, pro-Beijing politicians can't be happy that in addition to the black eye they received through the entire extradition bill fiasco, there were stations to register voters during the June 16th two million person protest. Even pro-Beijing politicians in Hong Kong must sometimes listen to their constituents. One of the most significant consequences of the recent exercise of democratic principles in Hong Kong is in the change in the political climate in Taiwan potentially boosting the chances of re-election for President Tsai Ing-wen. The people of, of Taiwan have always watched closely the situation in Hong Kong since the handover in 1997. They have seen problems unfolding with the one country, two systems model. But seeing the possibility of Hong Kong losing its judicial independence and watching the popular uproar against such a proposition solidified support in Taiwan for the people of Hong Kong. It is not surprising that Taiwan's leaders have been outspoken in their support for the protesters in Hong Kong, with President Tsai Ing-wen and others in her cabinet issuing statements and tweeting out messages of encouragement. What may be more noteworthy is the reaction of the opposition in Hong Kong to uh, in, in Taiwan to events in Hong Kong. Up until a few weeks ago, debate in the presidential campaign has been about economics and drawing closer to China. Now, because of events in Hong Kong, even the KMT candidates have had to come out against one country, two systems. The mayor of Kaohsiung and the opposition party KMT president hopeful said Saturday that China's one country, two systems formula for unification will never be put in place in Taiwan if he is president. I'm going to quote him. One country, two systems can never be implemented in Taiwan. Taiwanese people can never accept it unless, unless, unless it's over my dead body. At a rally, he led the crowd in chanting, reject one country, two systems. So the KMT is now on the back foot on its campaign to get closer to China. And it will be interesting to see how events unfold in this strong Asian democracy. I'd like to close with a quote from Chinese dissident and exiled writer Ma Jian, reflecting on the behavior of the Hong Kong protesters. He said, 30 years ago, I saw the same scene in Tiananmen Square as protesters parted to let ambulances through. Huge crowds can easily become violent mobs, but in China in 1989 and Hong Kong today, the vast crowds brought out the best of human nature, courage, wisdom, compassion. And I would argue that they have demonstrated a commitment to basic freedoms and democratic values from which we can all learn. Thank you, I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, we'll finish our presentations with Ambassador Tariq Karim. Thank you, Michael. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, I, I think Daniel gave the overview which was necessary to set, set the scene. And I will come back to one or two points which you, you raised. Uh, particularly, I will hack back to the symbolism of what happened in Tiananmen because I, I was a witness to that. I was posted in Beijing from 88 to 91 and had gone there just from India. So my conceptions of what the system, political system was in Beijing was overturned in exactly three or four months from after I landed. And uh, for me, it symbolized the, the inspirational outburst of humanity for something which they craved to the pushback by an entrenched establishment which had very clear and definite ideas of where they wanted to take that chunk of humanity and where they wanted to go. Uh, in a sense, well, Roy asked me to speak for about 10 minutes 
on the subject of democracy and governance in South Asia. And I said, hmm, that's like asking me to distill an entire ocean into a pond within 10 minutes. Uh, so I will, I will basically uh, touch on a few things, broad things, and then perhaps the Q&A uh, Q uh, session will, will bring out specifics. Number one, I think democracy in South Asia is in no better or worse shape than democracy anywhere else in the world today. I think, you know, every country has its own problems with how they are uh, uh, handling democracy and moving forward in it. Number two, governance, or rather good governance, is what we are concerned about. It's, it has a spotty record across the length and breadth of South Asia. Uh, so these are two general remarks which, which I want to place out front. Uh, number three, democracy was adopted by India at the time of transitioning from being a colonial entity of uh, a colonial power into coming into modernity. And basically, if you, if you, the, the leadership at the time transitioning to independence said, we will adopt democracy and the institutions, uh, basically the mother institutions being Westminster and the system being the way it is practiced in Britain. Uh, so that's number one. Now, if you take how long it took for democracy to really emerge into its own in Britain, from the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215 till the passing of Victoria in 1901, it was still a very imperial democracy. The bottom-up process overtook only after the passing of Victoria. So that's over 850 years or something, whatever the exact numbers is. It's, in other words, it is a, an organic evolution. And that took place in a small island with a small population over these 800 years with several revolutions dethronings, decapitations, till they come to the stage which we are all trying to emulate in South Asia. Number two, when the British conceded the principle of self-rule before independence, basically before that, two things which I would like, like to draw your attention to, who were going to be the practitioners of this new system they were creating? And I draw your attention to Lord Macaulay's famous minute to the parliament on how British edu or how Indian education system should be, which was in uh, 1835, where he said, we need to create a class or, or a body of Indians who will think like us, speak like us, behave like us, and carry our own ideas forward. Basically, roughly, that's what he said. So in other words, the British picked up people from different classes, different backgrounds, different castes, different regions, different religions, took them to England, educated them in Eton and Harrow and Oxford and Cambridge and elsewhere. And when these people went back, they went back with these ideas, the new ideas, that this is how we should govern ourselves without quite understanding that they, there was a vast gap between the way they looked at the world and their aspirations and what the people they were going to govern looked at. There was a huge gap to be filled in. In other words, what was, they tried to do the whole evolution of democracy in Britain of 850 years in that short span of when they were taking over. Uh, so in a sense, what we are seeing is still that that tension between the aspiration and the struggle to get there. They will be, India as a whole, now nobody calls it Indian subcontinent because it's politically incorrect in some countries, but the Indian subcontinent has an imperial legacy from 3,000 or 3 millennia at least, if not more. Depends how long you take the, take the history back. The, Imperial gene is very strongly embedded in the political character of the people. People still look on displacements as the dethroning of a ruler and a coming in of a new ruler. 
that is still the way they look at things and that is still in it it has diluted i mean i distinctly remember in 1976 77 when there was an attempt at coup before the news had spread there were no phones uh, no cell phones or uh, other devices people would heard by hear by word of mouth or through the radio the vendor who came to our house just said the king has been dethroned now i take that as the typical uh, uh, the the way of describing how he is viewing the political scene unfolding it's it's one ruler has been dethroned and somebody else is coming in but he doesn't know who all right so that is the mindset with which we are working uh, it is still democracy is still work in progress and all the south asian countries today are democracy but i would say they are democracies in different stages of imperfection uh, which democracy is perfect if somebody can tell me that then i'll 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 perhaps take that as the as the model and try and apply that to to india uh, now when the partition took place suddenly the democracy came into another big tussle the tussle was between having a parliamentary sort of democracy in the federal system and a aspiration of a certain group of people which kept growing towards a reversion to caliphate and 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 that tussle has continued in greater or lesser measure depending on on who are the people who come into power and what the configuration of alliances are in in at least india uh, in in pakistan and to some extent in bangladesh uh, so you have this constant struggle between authoritarianism edging towards that or democratization and the struggle for that i think in a sense bangladesh presents to you a constant struggle for trying to democratize despite the pushbacks by authoritarianism and i think that struggle will continue um, i agree with you that the elections in india is it's humongous 900 million out of 1.3 billion going out to vote over a period of 5 weeks or 6 7 weeks uh, it's a huge exercise uh, if you were to try and reduce that into a small containable uh, area geographical area uh, it boggles the imagination but by and large i think it it was a freely conducted election uh, you know i i haven't heard any of the major political players come out and point fingers and say that it was you know rigged and and we will not participate uh, in in bangladesh on the other hand there's always been uh, losers crying the grapes are sour every time they lose okay so that that tradition has yet to grow the institutions in india i think that is where the genius of the founding fathers was they invested in the institutions and i think they have taken roots there will be flaws there are still flaws there will be attempts by governments successive governments to try and mold the institutions in their favor but i think the institutions have that resilience to survive those attempts you might see ups and downs but if that system prevails i think the forecast would be let's say uh, cautiously optimistic yes the fear of majoritarianism taking over is there it's it's very much in the minds of bangladeshis as well and i suppose in in uh, 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 other uh, areas or within india among the minorities uh, these are early days we'll have to see how actually they cope with this absolute power that the present dispensation has uh, so it will be for me an interesting uh, uh, experience to watch how it unfolds because it will have implications for what happens in the other south asian countries uh, in bangladesh uh, it it was clearly an exercise in overkill uh, I, I personally think and, and uh, that even if there had been no interference, perhaps the ruling party would still have got uh, close to two thirds or even two thirds. Uh, the overkill was not necessary uh, simply because of one factor, I think, what you mentioned that the, the 
economic growth and the rate of growth has been phenomenal compared to anyone else in, uh, even in India. Pakistan is a, is a far cry now. And I think when that happens, generally, the people, people feel a sense of desensitization from the politics. They are happy in, in having the opportunity to make money and acquire more wealth. However, in the long run, it is creating within Bangladesh, perhaps, the, the main body of a middle class, a solid middle class, which is required. The second thing I think you need to keep in mind is that in the struggle, the tussle between, or the tension between the authoritarianism, anyone in power will want to stay in power forever. That's a given, whichever party it is. And anyone out of power will keep trying to mobilize forces to come and replace with his own ideas of how the state. That process, I think, will, will simmer and, and, and come forth. Because in Bangladesh, there has been a constant struggle and against overlong authoritarian rule. It's a question of time. And I think, in a sense, the government can count on development and economic development, keeping them safe for some time. But we are not developing in a vacuum. We are part of a huge ecosystem, a global ecosystem. Anything in that e ecosystem, any disturbance is going to disturb that growth. And when that happens, people will start reacting to it. So we will see that trend that Bangladeshis have consistently demonstrated over the last 50 years of their existence, and even longer if you take the uh, cohabitation with Pakistan, to say, this much I'll allow, but not beyond this. Now, what will trigger that off, I don't know. It could be a series of things coming together and gelling at one point when suddenly you will have an outburst. I mean, what triggered off the Ironman? Okay. Uh, there was perhaps under the surface a lot of things happening. But it was one death and the refusal of the government to give that person the honor that most people felt he should be given that just brought them out in the streets. From the largest demonstration having taken place 20 years earlier with only 200 people leading to Tiananmen in the beginning, end of May, I think it was. There were 500,000 people out in the streets of Beijing. And people coming out of the hutongs and offering them food and water and drinks to these students with flushed faces. Even a student came to me and I offered him a glass of water. He just said politely, sir, can you give me a glass of water? There were six intelligence people standing there, but they did not interfere. Precisely because the government itself didn't know how to handle this. And, and in a sense, it was then a question of allowing that uh, spontaneous chaotic outburst or controlling it and containing it, which, which basically in the end decided how they should proceed. Uh, what's happening in Hong Kong? I, I saw some uh, uh, forebodings of that when before Hong Kong was being handed over by the British to uh, China. Uh, I was there during the process at the time. I think that will keep happening. This is, this is, if we accept democracy as an evolutionary process, then this is where the struggle will continue. You will never have perfection, but you will always have the aspiration to perfection. And that, in that progression forward, there will be turbulences. There will be excesses. And hopefully in the end, there will be uh, a calm descending somewhere. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, before we open up for questions, I actually have one to throw um, to Dan. Um, we focused here largely on East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia. Uh, within the NBR universe, we consider Russia to be an Asian power. Um, and certainly within the context of this National Asia Research Program, um, we, we view Russia as an important uh, component of, of sort of thinking about U.S. Uh, strategic interests. Um, is IRI working in Russia? And do you have a sense of, um, you know, where does Russia sit? Is it, is it totally disconnected from these trends within Asia that you see? I mean, the trends, the trends I see that are buffeting Russia are trends in places like Armenia, which had a street revolution last year, a peaceful one, with a now a successful reformist new government. 
Ukraine, where three and four Ukrainians turned out to vote for uh, a candidate promising a, an unprecedented anti-corruption campaign to be a servant of the people. Uh, in Moldova, where you have very fractious politics riven between pro-Russian, pro-Western, uh, now has a very reformist, strongly pro-Western administration of quite an unusual caste. It's quite a, an unusual coalition. Um, it's, it's quite interesting to watch what's happening all over Russia's Western periphery because Russia is not immune from these trends. Uh, it's also interesting because, of course, Russia doesn't have the Asian development miracle to boast, right? Russia's economy, how many people know this? Russia's economy is about the size of the economy of Spain, okay? Which is not a top three or four European economy. Um, uh, Russia has missed the kind of development trajectory that China has launched. Um, in many ways, Russia has regressed. Without its oil and gas, it wouldn't be much of an economy at all. So Putin doesn't have that to offer to his people. There is no such compact of the kind that maybe there is between the CCP and the Chinese people, which is this broad-based uplifting into the middle class. So instead, Putin is offering a version, kind of an oligarchic, kleptocratic model that enriches a criminal elite. And What's interesting about Russia in this broader conversation is that um, his numbers have come way, way down. So uh, they're in economic dire straits. They attempted to raise the pension age last year, and Russians took to the streets in almost every major city in Russia to protest that. I mean, you actually had street power in Russia, so they rolled back those pension reforms. They have had to cut the defense budget by 20% in the last six months. So. Um, Russia, in many ways, missed the Asian economic miracle boat and does not have the same toolkit to offer to its citizens that maybe other authoritarian regimes like China would. And it very much looks like an outlier, including in its own cultural space in kind of wider Europe. Okay, thank you. But, but yet, I mean, you can't, you, you can't not pay attention to the growing China-Russia relationship and, 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 and what that means, not necessarily for the people inside of Russia, but... Um, you know, there, there is a very close relationship between Putin and Xi. Uh, China's energy purchases uh, from Russia are extremely important to the Russia economy. And uh, I would certainly point to the, the near collision in the South China Sea between the Russian naval ship and the U.S. naval ship as something that, that uh, you know, is, is Russia out there doing China's bidding and, and what does that ultimately mean? Well, rather than getting sidetracked into uh, China-Russia cooperation, which is something we've worked on a lot and uh, it's been discussed a lot over the last day and a half, let's open this up for questions. Um, as before, if you could state your name and your affiliation, ask a brief question, and then we'll direct that to the panelists. Let me start. Young man here. Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Julian Kyle Lewis from the American University here in Washington. I had the privilege of serving as the Associate Director in the Office of Presidential Correspondence at the White House in 2011. And I have a question concerning China. Recently in international headlines, um, the visa that Chinese students are using to come to the United States to attend college is causing some problems. And parents in China are now vastly reconsidering sending their children to the United States for uh, an education of higher learning. And the problem that kind of poses for people is that you're now able to identify young Asian Americans who are not university students, who can masquerade as university students. So China's able to see, okay, well, who's pro-Chinese and who's not? So I was wondering, do you have any thoughts on the effects of that visa uh, on the perception that Asian parents have of sending their children over here? Thanks. Do you want to start? No, it's for you. Um, I'll, I'll speak briefly. Um, I know that the situation regarding Chinese students, I don't think I can speak to the issue of Asian American parents' concerns <laughs> other than to say that um, the, the sort of the crackdown on the admission of Chinese students to the United States raises a real risk of, of uh, 
of racial profiling, ethnic profiling, that I think needs to be concern, uh, of concern. Um, there, are, there are a lot of legitimate questions about who the Chinese government has been sending to, to study here in the United States. It's certainly not everybody, but um, uh, colleges and universities are having to face uh, the situation where graduate schools who have been sent to study um, sensitive technologies, you know, nanotechnology, new materials, um, quantum computing, things like that, are taking what they have learned here, often research that has been paid for by the, the U.S. government one way or another, by the U.S. taxpayers, and taking it back to China. And, the, and there are growing concerns about that. So I think it's an issue where we're, we're going to have to find some sort of balance between uh, allowing students here uh, to, to, to come and study and protecting American intellectual property at the same time. It's an issue that I know that colleges, uh, universities, and presidents are really grappling to, with, too. Okay, put a gentleman right here. Hi, Robert Shines, Bright Group Consulting USA. I heard from the panel this morning that value should be the focus of the U.S.'s long-term competition with China. Um, however, it seems that this focus ser only serves to exacerbate existing tensions with China, whether it's Hong Kong or Tibet or Xinjiang or uh, Taiwan, all of which the Chinese will consider their core security interests or internal security interests. Um, and we also see that the U.S. is cooperating more with Vietnam to balance China. So if the U.S. can find a balancing act between values and pragmatism with respect to cooperating with Vietnam, how can the U.S. do the same to further values or further areas of cooperation with China? So my view, you know, um, no country has done more for modern China's rise than the United States, right? Pulling them into the global trading system, uh, embracing them after the Maoist destruction that ended with the Cultural Revolution. Um, America has been the greatest sponsor of China's modernization and rise. Uh, incidentally, the country that gave more development assistance to China than any other was Japan, which the Chinese system about 10 years ago decided to vilify Japan and make them enemy number one for reasons of political party mobilization inside of China, of Communist Party legitimation. So um, the U.S. looks to my analytic eye like a status quo power in Asia. We've had a set of alliances. We've been there ever since the end of the Pacific War. Uh, we didn't particularly want to be there. Uh, it turns out that uh, Imperial Japan uh, conquered the region and we decided maybe let's not do that again. So we fought and we stayed uh, by invitation from a number of governments, including in Thailand, including in the Philippines, including in Japan. Um, uh, no country has done more to provide the public goods that enabled modern Asia's, not just China's, but all of Asia's rise than the United States. That sea lane security, the fact that you haven't had intensive arms racing and balancing kind of destructive military, military competition in Asia, the US force presence and security umbrella neutralized, neutered a lot of that, which enabled China to rise so successfully. So I think the better question for the audience is why do current China's leaders wanna put all of that at risk? Why do they wanna put all of that at risk? Um, is it a nationalist project? Is it about the Chinese Communist Party's lack of legitimate control over society because it will not contest a free election? But why put all of that economic miracle and that uh, decades and decades of peace at risk? And I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I would argue that values here are really important, that, that, that the world, what was it, Ronald Reagan said, the, 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 city on, the shining city on the hill? Sorry? H.W. Bush, the shining city on the hill. I mean, uh, 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 American, you know, uh, uh, America has been built on people coming here, seeking the very freedoms that we are talking about. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of association, and uh, freedom of the press. I mean, it's enshrined in our constitution, these things. Um, I would also say that I actually don't think that values have been core to U.S.-China policy. I lived through the MFN debates in the 1990s, and uh, human rights lost out to business deals just every single time. Um, and I, I don't see human rights being something, these values uh, being something that's particularly uh, core 
to how the U.S. defines its, its China policy. It's actually something I, I take issue with. Um, but I would also say at the same time, how can we turn a blind eye to what is happening to the Uyghurs, to the Tibetans, to the Christians in, inside of, of China? I mean, that, 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 that gives lie to the history of the terrible things that we've seen taking place in this, in, in this world. And I think that we have to be better than that. Further questions? Yes, right here. Thank you. I'm Jin Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans, Commissioner Bartholomew. Thank you for your work. And so you have uh, been advising the Congress bipartisanly with the Commission. Um, would you advise our Congress, senators and congressmen, <coughs> to take action on it more definitely, positively, because that should come from the action of the Congress? Um, for example, the situation of Hong Kong that you talked so passionately about, of the Uyghurs and of Taiwan, we all wanted democracy. I speak for Vietnamese Americans. We spoke by leaving Vietnam and came here. We fleeing on the sea, risking our lives for democracy. And I would speak for many friends on the mainland of China. The Chinese people, 1.3 billion of us, wanted democracy. That's the values. And we're reaching out to the shining city on the hill, <laughs> asking for help. So obviously the US has helped China to bring them rise from the poverty, hoping that at this point in time, the people will realize the values are important and we would choose democracy over dictatorship. We would choose voting over one party control. We have made the choice. The Hong Kong people have spoken their choice. Two millions of them just now. We have made the choice in 1989 at the Tiananmen Square and the massacre happened and President Bush turned away, continued to work to help China hoping that today, at this point in time, the people will make the choice. The choice has been made, has been pronounced, has been proclaimed. So what, Commissioner, would you advise our senators and congressmen and our next president to take actions on? This um, Senator Gordon made the point that we are at the challenging time now, and we don't seem to realize it. And yesterday, I think Dr. Allen said, um, it may come the time of crisis that we may not have time to wait. We should take action. What would you recommend our senators to do, Congre that, Commissioner? Well, uh, uh, again, do, do, do you have any, um, then? <laughs> uh, you know, there, there are a series of things, of course, that, that members of Congress can do. Um, uh, Senator Gordon, you know, when we went through the, the debate on permanent normal trade relations and uh, paving China's way into the WTO, um, there, there was an argument that economic reform would lead to political reform inside China. But it's 20 years on now, and we haven't seen that. I recognize that the horizon is long and 20 years is very short. But what we have seen is that Xi Jinping has been cracking down rather than opening up. Um, I'll speak specifically to Hong Kong. Um, obviously, uh, there, were, there were senators, the Speaker of the House made strong statements. And one of the things that they mentioned was the need perhaps, if this, not perhaps, if the extradition bill passed, that we must do a reassessment of, of Hong Kong's special status. And I think that it was raising attention and focus on the fact that you can't take that special status for granted. That also helped inside of Hong Kong to give some, some oomph to what people were doing. Uh, of course, it, it means that Beijing blames us, right? It's, it's US people who are involved in fomenting rebellion in Hong Kong. They were gonna blame us no matter what. Um, but, but acknowledging that, that we have been giving special benefits and special treatment to Hong Kong, which has been beneficial to Beijing, which needs the money that goes through Hong Kong 
um, threatening that, I think, is, is something that was a very important step for people to take. And when we were in Hong Kong, I mean, the pro-democracy people I have known for 30 years in Hong Kong were quite split. It was the first time I have ever heard some of these people invoke what they call the nuclear option, which would be taking away the special status for, for Hong Kong. Nobody was ready to get there yet because they recognize that if that happens, then Hong Kong as we know it really does disappear. I would acknowledge really the American business community who were particularly engaged on this issue, AmCham, uh, Hong Kong. It is not easy for the American business community to speak out on anything that upsets Beijing because there are consequences for it, but they recognized the importance of fighting against this ex extradition bill. And in fact, they've done a statement since, since the protests have happened saying it shouldn't just be suspended, it should be withdrawn completely. So Congress is definitely engaged on that. And then the other issues, I think it's, it's really part of a bigger conversation that we need to be having about what, what Congress could be doing. Anything to add about that? Let me just, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of parallel between those two last questions, because that tension between values and strategic interests has always been there. Um, you know, since 1945, the United States has had to balance uh, a strategy to defeat the Soviets in the Cold War and maintaining um, a sort of a democratic freedom uh, principles and, and balancing how hard and how strongly to push those in different areas of the world. Um, if I look at the situation, say, since 1989, since 1991, there was a period in which the US could push without much push back because it felt like we had, you know, we defeated communism, we defeated an authoritarian model, and there was no alternative. Um, I think our experience is looking at uh, post 9-11, um, very difficult uh, occupations of, of Afghanistan and of Iraq, uh, and the rise of China, they've all changed that calculation. So this is an active debate that's taking place within the strategic community, within the human rights community, the democracy community, and it's an important conversation for us to be having uh, within the policy so, community broadly. But can I add something there, which is that how you define strategic interests. Because through the 1990s, I would argue that it was commercial and financial interests. It wasn't even strategic interests as we think of them necessarily, They're the, what was driving US-China policy. Um, you mentioned, Dan, that, I mean, China built its economy under the US security umbrella. It built, the, it built its economy with the money that, that it built its, the PLA with the money that got from the, the US trade with China, the profit that they were making. If we had been thinking more strategically at the time, we might have recognized that some of these policies were not the most sensible way to go for the future. Yeah. So question in the front right here. Uh, Bob Eichert from the Atlantic Council. We've obviously had a lot of focus on the question of Chinese economic expansion, infrastructure investment, and the debt trap problems. Um, the issue, one of the issues I think, which I'd be interested in your comments on is, what, what impact are you seeing in different countries with regards to the political aspects of that, with regards to government institutions, political interest groups, public participation, and I've particularly been interested in Pakistan, given the huge investments that they're making in Pakistan. So your question was on Chinese investment. That was the beginning of it, on yes. the role of China. Yes. So this is quite interesting. It also links to, thank you for asking the question. It links to Michael's very good point, which is this question of interests and values. You know, the landscape out there is so different now. And one thing that I keep hearing American senior officials express is an American interest in helping countries in Asia protect their sovereignty by building institutional resiliency against state capture by, say, a giant neighbor who floods your country with Belt and Road investments. And so this is quite a different conversation than we would have had 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Um, I heard H.R. McMaster, when he was National Security Advisor, make a case that American grand strategy needed to be about helping smaller countries protect their sovereignty. Because as long as countries are sovereign, we as Americans can be confident, as long as they're sovereign and democratic, I would add, we can be confident that broadly they will do the right thing. If they are not sovereign, if they are captured, if they are neutralized, including some of our American allies, not just in Asia, but also in Europe, that changes the equation. And I think we couldn't envision 10 or 20 years ago what would neutralize or capture countries. We now can, in fact. 
Uh, this may not, not always be a design of Chinese strategy, but it can certainly be an outcome or an effect. You can also just have an effect where all of this money and investment washing in corrupts politics in a smaller country. Um, you've seen very dramatic examples. I mean, one, I keep thinking of Asian countries, there are all these ones we haven't talked about yet, the Philippines, Burma, the Maldives, but I want to do the Maldives. Uh, the Maldives had a pivotal election last September in which uh, essentially a dictator held an election he thought he was going to win. 90% of voters turned out and voted him out of office. The new government, essentially comprised of the democratic opposition, pivoted the country away from China and some Gulf states and towards India. Uh, it was a strategic 180 degree shift resulting from a democratic election. Uh, one of the big issues this new democratic government in the Maldives is bumping into, just like in Sri Lanka they have bumped into, is the legacy inheritance of Chinese deals that the former government made. And how do you get out of debt traps is kind of a term that's thrown around a lot, so I want to be careful with the term, but how do you get out of a set of deals that say an authoritarian, corrupt, preceding government made when those deagle, deals are legally enshrined in international law documents. Uh, the Maldivians are struggling with it now, just like the Sri Lankans have been struggling with it. In Malaysia, there's been a debate that Prime Minister Mahathir has led about rebalancing some of the Chinese investments that came in under the previous regime. So this is something that I hope America can help. And part of the answer is transparency, obviously, and institutional strength. Yeah. I mean, there are examples also of, of uh, Chinese influence through this kind of financing at the, at the UN and in multilateral institutions. Um, I'm also thinking of, of Cambodia, uh, Cambodia and Laos acting in ASEAN to, to you know, it's a, it's a consensus organization acting to stop some sort of um, action, uh, the UNCLOS ruling on the Philippines. Um, and then there's a quote, I won't get it right, but this is about, this is, uh, so, so of course Vanuatu is, an, is another place where the Chinese are, are investing and um, what Vanuatu is, is or might be doing in places like the UN is an issue. But, but uh, there was somebody in Greece who, who actually put it out there without the Chinese even asking how Greece was going to vote or to vote a particular way at the UN. And he just basically said, when somebody helps you, you don't, you don't slap them in the face. You, you do what needs to be done. So that was a proactive, that wasn't even Beijing going to Greece and saying, okay, we've, we've um, invested in all of your ports. Um, now you need to do this for us. People are doing it preemptively. So it's having a huge impact. Thank you. Um, Gentleman on the front here. Actually, let's take this question and then Chris behind you and then have the panelists respond to those last two questions. We're almost out of time here. Great, thank you for your interesting presentations. Uh, this is kind of relevant to the previous discussion we were talking about with how do you do the balance between strategic interests and values. And we're all aware that authoritarian governments are very paranoid and they tend to see the U.S. hand even when we'd have nothing to do with the situation, especially if it's internal instability in their countries. So when there are large street protests taking place, what kind of moral or logistical or rhetorical support can the United States give to the opposition movements without it being the kiss of death? Thank you. And then Chris behind Uh, I was wondering, uh, particularly for some of the panel who I know are watching India quite closely, um, how the right way is to manage expectations in DC about what democracy might look like in India. Um, in particular, we have a home minister now who said that Bangladeshi migrants were termites and the Muslim migrants might need to be thrown into the Indian Ocean and that that was something the BJP government would do. Um, and I think there could be similar concerns about India's Christian minorities over the coming decade. But as Michael, I think, compellingly said, that sort of tension between strategic interests and, and values is always there. So uh, I guess I'm just curious whether you think DC is in the right headspace if things turn in a more majoritarian, to use Dan Twining's earlier phrase, direction in Delhi, which seems possible at least. Tariq, you want to take yeah, the first start. If I may uh, address the, the second question first, yes. and then perhaps. Uh, yes, uh, the appointment of Mr. Amit Shah, who's been the chief uh, vocal proponent of what he called throwing out the illegals, etc., uh, has created a lot of uh, uh, disquiet in, among many Bangladeshis across the board. And certainly uh, his announcement made, I think, three or four days ago that he's going to set up uh, national registry tribunals across the whole 
length and breadth of India. So it was previously only in Assam. Now it's going to cover, uh, uh, you know, they're going to be set up in the remaining 28 states and the Union, Union territories. Uh, certainly doesn't uh, bode well for, uh, uh, how shall I put it, uh, lessening the discord that is there among the neighbors, particularly in Bangladesh. Uh, if, you, if you take the configuration, Bangladesh is surrounded by India on all sides. So there are seven states, states which are its immediate neighbors. How is that going to affect? Bangladesh at the moment is having to host some one million plus refugees from Myanmar. And so people are wondering, India's uh, somewhat lukewarm uh, attitude towards what the Myanmaris were doing in pushing out the Rohingyas, was that a prequel or, uh, for what they wish to do with uh, who, uh, people they considered illegal in, in their own countries? Uh, it's not going to be conducive to regional stability, number one. I think there was an attempt previously during the Vajpayee government to push back people in and Bangladesh stood steadfast and so that was abandoned. How will this will play out this time? I, I can just hope that nothing like that happens. However, if this majoritarian streak displays signs of being increasingly intolerant of minorities in India. My fear is that they could be, it could trigger off backlash within its neighbors, where there are also sizable minorities. Mm -hmm. and, and that certainly is not good for regional stability or peace, which has security implications and strategic implications for US also. Uh, so certainly I think U.S. And, and friends of South Asia should remain engaged to see, particularly since U.S. has now what I would call a sort of strategic partnership or relationship with, with India, to say that you need to handle this with greater maturity. Uh, you, you, you have established yourself uh, as the number one there. Now try to be uh, a government for all. And, and, and whether that will happen or not, we have to see. Uh, within the party, uh, you know, there, there are very strong, uh, 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 you know, the, the uh, ideology which is governing the, the BJP. And if, you know, you could have bodies or independent or small bodies in different places taking off independent action, that could create problems which, they may not, which the government may not be able to control. So it's all the more necessary for the government now to reach out. I think Prime Minister Modi has, in his initial statements, given these uh, 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 signals that he wants to reach out and include the minority. Uh, Mr. Amit Shah's statement is contradictory to that. Now, how is this going to play out? We'll have to see. These are still very early days. And does one of you want to take on the first question? I will, and then you, <coughs> you can, because you guys do this. But um, I would say certainly when it comes to China, they're going to blame us whether we speak out or not. Um, and, and I think that it's, uh, it is important to the people who are doing the opposition to know that they aren't alone, uh, which, which creates a, a real incentive for us to make sure that we are speaking out on behalf of the rights that they're fighting for. Um, uh, my former boss, Ms. Pelosi, used to say what political prisoners when they were released would say is the, the, the most anguishing thing was that when um, the, their, their captors would say, nobody knows you're here and nobody cares you're here. And for them to know that there are people who support what they're doing, I think is a, is a really important thing. Dan? So um, I just wanna, I suspect Chris has a very sophisticated answer to his own question, but I'm quite seized with this India question. You know. My personal view is that, you know, Modi strongly outpolls his party. So many Indians voted for Modi, I think, because of this aspirational promise that he has made to Indians, that he will deliver modernization and growth and make them proud to be Indians uh, in a dynamic economy and India taking its place in the world. Um, what will weaken India 
is the kind of internal cleavages that frankly have weakened India historically that led to the colonial experience, for instance. And so if India is really going to be strong and rise as a great power to become a world power, it cannot be excessively divided from within. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to say, well, gosh, um, this group or that group is just a little minority. But in India, a minority, I mean, 200 million Muslims, 200 million people is a lot of people, even if it's a minority, um, almost 200 million. So uh, my sense is that the India system, the democratic process is actually capable of grappling with this. Let us see. Um, Social media has kind of changed the game on these questions just in the last few years and kind of Modi and the BJP's very adept use of it. Um, I, I agree with you entirely is that what we hear all over the world from say dissidents who have come out of prison is what gave me strength was to know that I was not lost and alone, that some Nancy Pelosi or Ronald Reagan or whatever era you're in was speaking up for me or that America was uh, speaking up for me. What I find in our work today around the world is countries and leaders and activists are surprised when America doesn't speak up. And frankly, not just for the last two years, but for the last 10 or so years, I've gotten a lot of people all over the world saying, why isn't America speaking up about these fundamental principles? So this is not a partisan point at all. It's that it's actually what the world expects from us and uh, both Democrats and authoritarians out there are surprised when we do not uh, reflect our fundamental values. That's a great way to finish this conversation on democracy. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> <laughs>